Praise the Lord. So today, we're going to do a brief study on Ephesians 1. It is an awesome chapter, and it will encourage you. So before we start, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we lift up our hearts to you today, and we ask you to speak to us in spirit and in truth, according to your word. Lord, I ask that you will help us to draw close to you. Lord, we want to hear from you. And Lord, your word is is you speaking to us. And I pray, Lord, you'll help me to properly teach your word. And Lord, give us understanding of what you want to share with us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're going to read today from Ephesians 1. So, um, I like to use the Blue Letter Bible app because I can use it on my phone and I can highlight. Okay, there are so many tools with the Blue Letter Bible app. Uh, it's so extensive. I've actually made some tutorials on on this app. A couple different ones because I keep discovering new amazing things it does. So, but they also have the Blue Letter Bible also has a web uh, a website that you can look at scriptures. So we're going to use that today because I can share my screen and it'll make it easier for us to uh, follow. Okay, so <clears throat> what I'm going to do is just read a few scriptures and then talk about them. And on a couple of them, we're going to go into the Greek interlinear because I feel that you get more depth from doing that. It's a great way to study the Bible, to look at cross-references is one way. And also, um, because the Bible will explain itself when you go to other scriptures and look at them in context. Keep in mind the English word that is used in the translation is not always, when you're looking at the root word, whether it's Hebrew or Greek, it is not always the same word. So you want to be aware, uh, because some you want to compare apples to apples when you're, when you're studying the scriptures. Okay, so let's read, starting with Ephesians. So this is Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm going to go there on my app at the same time. It's just here because I've marked it up. Okay. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to point out right away, he mentions that the saints which are believers, people who have been born again and say, you know what, I follow Jesus, he's the son of God, and he, took, he died on the cross to take my sins away. And I want my name written in the Lamb's book of life. So I confess that I'm a sinner, and I've said, Lord, I want you to be my Lord of my life and my Savior. I receive you, and I follow you. Okay, so once you do that, say that prayer with, and mean it in your heart, it's simple. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. <clears throat> and not only that, you are now a saint of the Lord. A saint is just someone who loves the Lord and follows Him. And notice that when Paul is writing to Ephesus, he's referring to them as faithful. So, you know, they're not fair-weather disciples. Okay, they're consistent. They say, Lord, I want you every day in my life. You're my Lord and Savior, and every day I want you, your will done in my life. Because God's will for us is perfect. All right, now let's continue reading. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. 
See, that didn't say a few spiritual blessings. That says every spiritual blessing. If we need to meditate on that, and we can go to 1 Corinthians 12 and other scriptures to look at what are some of these spiritual blessings? What are some of the gifts that the Lord appoints and gives to men? And Paul tells us we can pray and ask for more. So, uh, you know, we can, we'll go into the gifts another time, but I want to just continue reading. Now, this is going to get really interesting. So, uh, the Lord has blessed us with, with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, the anointed one, the Savior of the world, just as he chose us in him. So that's God the Father chose us in Christ Jesus. So he is God the Father, just as he, the Father, chose us in him, Christ Jesus. Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So, you know, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, that was not a surprise to the Lord. They sinned because they were deceived by the evil one who willingly betrayed God and was cast out of heaven like lightning. But God loved us and he already had a plan of redemption And he already had a plan for us to be in the family of God through his only son, Jesus Christ. And God loved us so much. So this is why it says, before the foundation of the world, God chose us and called us to be holy and without blame in Christ in love. Okay. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ. Christ himself according to his good the, the pleasure of his will the good pleasure of his will and to the praise and glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved this is just such a powerful verse that I don't want or a couple verses I don't want us to rush through it so so the father chose us in Christ Jesus this is his this is his perfect will that what he wants is that humanity would would receive Christ and receive the love of God and the love of Jesus Christ and love him back and follow him. But remember, God does not violate our will. He gives us the choice. The choice is this is what my son has done for you. Will you love him back? Will you love me back? I, I have bridged that gap through my son. There's no more a divide between God and man because of sin. Jesus has paid that price and filled the gap. So <clears throat> we just have to say yes and mean it. So um, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ himself. So... God wants to adopt us into the family of God through Christ because the blood of Jesus, the power is in the blood. His blood is what paid the price for sin. His blood that was shed at the cross is what gives us the redemption for eternal life because Jesus took our punishment for us at the cross. Not only that, He rose again. If he hadn't risen again, it would not have been complete. But he rose again on the third day, just as it was prophesied. Jesus said, I give you, the only sign I give you is the sign of Jonah, who was in the belly of the whale for three days. And see, Jesus was in the belly of the earth for three days, and then he rose again. And he conquered the, he conquered death, and he got the keys to death and Hades that we had lost from the beginning because when God made Adam and Eve and he gave them dominion over the earth, we had dominion over the earth. But when we sinned and ate of the fruit that God told us not to, which by the way, when Eve first did that, they both sinned, but Eve was first. It was not that she just 
ran to the tree and said, I just have to have this tree. No, she was deceived by the enemy. So, you know, yes, they fell and they brought all this curse on this earth. But it's temporary. It's temporary. Because then Jesus came. He fulfilled hundreds of prophecies of his first coming as the Lamb who takes away the sins of the earth, of the world. And then, <clears throat> when he went to the Father after he rose again, he sent the Holy Spirit. So when we're born again, the scripture says we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God until the day of redemption. Okay? And, and the Holy Spirit of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come and live in our spirit with us when we're born again. God is with you. So talk to him. Listen to him. He's with you. We're not fighting this race alone because we couldn't do it. He's with us. If you haven't received Christ, receive him today. It's the only answer in eternity. It's forever. And if you have received him, I want you to know he's with you. And the battle is the Lord. So give him your cares. Cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. And the scripture says, the battle is the Lord. It's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So we submit our concerns, our daily life, our needs to the Lord. And he answers those prayers. And let me tell you, this is 2020 I'm record when I'm recording this um, teaching, June 2020. And I've never seen God answer prayer so fast in my life. Do you know why? Because the time is short. We're so close to the finish line. What is the finish line? The finish line is the rapture of the bride of Christ, which is a picture of a Jewish wedding in ancient times and then a seven year tribulation it's talked about in the book of Daniel Daniel 9 read Daniel 9 through 12 because it tells you about the future and it parallels with what's going to happen in Revelation and we're going to be going through Revelation so I want you to um, hopefully you'll tune in for that um, series because people aren't being taught revelation and it's relevant to our lives. Now the church, the body of Christ, those who are overcomers, we are not called to wrath. In Revelation, the book of Revelation, which means the revealing, the first three chapters, so chapters one is an introduction and an overview of the, of the book. And then chapters 2 and 3 contain seven letters that Jesus himself wrote to the churches. And the, and the book of Revelation in the beginning says, Blessed is he who reads and understands this book. So, it's very important that we read it. Of course, you know, understanding is a process. But I'm going to do my best to help you. And I've listened to some of the best teachers there are on this book. That dive into the Greek. Go into the Old Testament. Because there's so many references to the Old Testament. So if you don't understand the Old Testament, it's going to be hard to grasp the fact that Revelation is literal. It is not figurative. It is actually going to happen. So you've got seven letters that Jesus wrote to seven churches. And <clears throat> five of those churches had issues where they had sin in the camp. And Jesus said, this is what's going on. I need you to repent and stay close to me, close to me. And I will give you eternal life. I will, he gives all these different promises that have to do with ruling and reigning in the millennial reign with Christ. So, here's the timeline. You've got the church age. This is what we're in and we're on the home stretch of it. 
Then you've got the rapture, harpazo. It's a Greek word. Har the Greek word is harpazo, G726. This is where we get the word rapturos from in Latin, and we translate it English, rapture. What does it mean? It means to be caught up, to be snatched away. Okay, and so the church is caught up to a wedding because in the New Testament, Jesus is referred to as our bridegroom. And we, the church, the body of Christ, it's not a building, it's the people who love him, are referred to as the bride of Christ, the bride of Christ. So we have a wedding to go to. We have a wedding to go to. And did you know that in the ancient Jewish wedding, it was a seven day wedding. Did you know that the tribulation is seven years? So it's a picture, it's a parallel picture. And I will do a separate teaching on that to go into much more detail. But you have the rapture of the bride of Christ. Then you have a seven-year tribulation. Did you know the seven-year tribulation is also called the time of Jacob's trouble? The time of Jacob's trouble. What does that mean? Did you know Israel? That name was originally from their father Jacob, who God changed his name to Israel. So Israel and Jacob, sometimes that word is interchangeable because it because Abraham Isaac and Jacob and God changed Jacob's name from Jacob to Israel at a certain point and so that's why that's why the seven-year tribulation is referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble because they had not recognized their Messiah Yeshua Jesus when he came the first time and as a matter of fact, there's scripture in Matthew that um, there's a scripture in Matthew that, that where Jesus was standing on a mount looking over the city and he wept and he said, Oh, Israel, Israel, if only thou hadst known the hour of thy visitation. And then he goes on, Because you have not known, da 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 da. So they had a lot of. They've had, over the years, so much heartache and, and attack. However, then there's prophecies that talk about that then in the latter days, God will bring Israel back to their country. So this happened in, on May 14, 1948, shortly after World War II. Israel became a nation again. And in Isaiah, it talks about, is, it, is a nation born in a day yeah they were they were because God did that and then the scriptures talk about how um, how God will flourish them so did you know that Israel's one of the top producers they're one of the top 10 productive blessed flourishing military even nations of the world so God's prophecies have all come to pass and there's only a few that were his past prophecies about the destruction of Israel, but then the rebuilding of Israel have come to pass. Now, there's not much left to do. So the time of Jacob's trouble is a seven-year time in the tribulation. And it's going to be the first three and a half years, Israel is going to be... Um, they're actually going to be um, resuming the Old Testament sacrifice in the temple. There is going to be a temple built, on the, I believe, on the Temple Mount, but in Jerusalem. And they are going to resume this old the Old Covenant sacrifice because they don't understand that Jesus is the New Covenant and we don't need to do that anymore. His blood covers everything. But let me tell you something. Three and a half years into the seven-year tribulation, which is the midpoint, this false 
this leader, he's a world leader known as the Antichrist. All that means is he's a pseudo-Christ, a, a type of Christ, but it's a false. And the whole world receives him like he's uh, this great peacemaker, but he's not. He's deceitful and evil. And at the three and a half year period, the scripture says Satan literally enters into him and takes over his body. And he commits the abomination of desolation, which means he goes into the Holy of Holies inside the temple. And he himself declares himself to be God and he wants to be worshipped. Not only does he want to, he requires the whole world to worship him. And in Matthew 24, Jesus says, when you, he's talking to Israel, when you see the abomination of desolation, flee to the mountains, don't even go down to your house to get your clothes. It's that dangerous. Now, um, so I wasn't planning on going into all this today, but I guess the Lord wanted us to. So, um, so this is just an overview. I will go into a more in-depth study on this where I have a lot more scriptures for you and maybe like some charts. But um, the second three and a half years are called the Great Tribulation. So you have a seven-year tribulation when all hell breaks loose on earth. Trust me. From Revelation chapter 6, when the very first seal is open, because there's seven seals that are open. When the very first seal is open, it's bad from the beginning. <clears throat> However, at the midpoint, at the three and a half year point, oh, it's even worse. And, and at the very end, now we don't know, some of the seals, we're not exactly sure if if the last one or two, which are pretty horrific, all happen in a really short period of time at the very end, which is very possible, because honestly, I don't know how you would survive on the earth if stars are falling out of heaven and hitting the earth like figs off a fig tree, and the mountains are moved and the islands are moved out of this place. So I think that all happens at the very end, very rapidly. But in spite of that, we still know that at the three and a half year period, this is when the Antichrist, which is this world leader, requires everyone in the world to worship him. And to take a mark that's his mark. So we know that, you know, that's referred to as the mark of the beast. People usually know about, they've heard that. But that's what that means. Uh, I don't know if it's an RFID chip. I don't know if it's what it is. But it's something that can be scanned. And it's on your forehead or it's in your right, your right hand. So, um, he says you cannot buy or sell without it. Um, let me just say this. The, those who are close to the Lord and watching for His coming will go in the rapture and not be a part of this. Because the scripture says we in, in 1 Thessalonians, we are not appointed to God's wrath. And the seven-year tribulation is defined by two things. One, it is the time of Jacob's trouble. And the purpose of that is that Israel goes through a very difficult time. But at the end, they finally realize there's only one Messiah. It's not the Antichrist. There's only one Messiah. It's the one Yeshua who they missed the first time. And they finally recognize that. It's also the wrath of God on a wicked world who shake their fist at God in rebellion and, and they love wickedness and evil and they hate righteousness and the Lord. And so when you're reading this different seal, so there's seven seals, there's seven trumpets, there's seven bowls. There's quite a lot of wrath that's poured out and this is the wrath of God. And when it's, um, when it's poured out after each event, do you know it says in the scriptures, and they repented not of their deeds. That's how hard their hearts are. That's how evil they are. All this wrath is coming, and they still won't bend their knee and repent to God and say, we're sorry. So this is why it's going to be just horrible. And we... I mean, literally it talks about horrible, evil creatures even coming out of the pit of hell onto earth. Um, 
And I believe that happens at the second half. But the point is, is we do not want to be here. And Jesus tells us in Luke 21, pray that you are counted worthy to escape the things to come. He's talking about pray that you're counted worthy, close to him, an overcomer, not being compromised by sin, <clears throat> permissive sin in your life. Pray that you're counted worthy, close to him, so that you go up in the wedding and you're not left behind. See, Matthew 25 talks about a parable of ten virgins. And these ten virgins are all part of the wedding party. What's the wedding party represent? The bride of Christ. So this is talking about ten virgins who all call themselves Christians after the name of the Lord. So, you know, this is not a wedding party that half of them are worldly people that don't call themselves by the name of the Lord. This is ten virgins who all call themselves by the name of the Lord. They declare, I believe in Jesus. Okay? So whether they're <clears throat> a denomination or no denomination, but they say, I'm born again, I believe Jesus is my Savior. Okay, that's who this, these ten virgins are. People who say that. However, five of those virgins were wise and they kept oil in their lamps. And five of those virgins were foolish and they did not bring oil with their lamps. And the five who were wise, let's actually go to that verse real quick. I want to read this. Let's read this parable. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Okay, now make note that the whole wedding party, all ten of them, got weary of waiting and watching for the Lord's return, for the bridegroom. They all got tired. However, five of them still kept had oil. So what does that oil represent? Some say that's the Holy Spirit, but I'll tell you the bottom line. That oil means you're on fire for God. That oil means you know him and he knows you. How do we know the Lord? The number one way to know the Lord is to read his word because he's speaking to us. When we read the word of God, and we should read both from the Old Testament, which is the Old Covenant, and the New. Why is that? Because Jesus is concealed in the Old Testament and he's revealed in the New. And did you know Jesus himself quoted from Deuteronomy more than any other book? Did you know Jesus quoted from the Old Covenant? Did you know that the New Testament church didn't have the New Testament? They came to salva saving knowledge, salvation, in Jesus Christ through the Old Testament scriptures, the prophecies of Jesus, and how he fulfilled them. It's important. Did you know we should read the Psalms every day? Did you know the Psalms help us? I heard Pastor say this. Pastor Ray Bentley. The Psalms help us to learn how to emotionally engage with the Lord. Oh, it's so true. David went through so much stress and turmoil for so many years. We can identify, not necessarily his specific situation, but to his emotion, to the, the stress and anxiety sometimes from situation. And we can learn from him how he cried out to the Lord and how he praised the Lord, how he worshipped the Lord, how he put all his trust in the Lord every time. 
And this is why, even though he made some very serious mistakes, and, and he had to reap the consequences of those mistakes to some degree, but this is why God said he was a man after his own heart. Because he loved God and he believed him and he put his trust in him. Did you know that faith, faith, which is the substance of things hoped for, and evidence of things not seen, meaning we're hoping and believing and trusting in the Lord, even though we don't see any signs that it's happening, what we're praying for, okay? But we don't quit believing. We don't quit believing. And when we pray, God, thy will be done, your will be done, on this earth, in my life, in my family, when you pray, Lord, your will be done, God will answer that prayer every time perfectly. Because you know what? His will is the perfect plan for our lives. Perfect plan. That is, like, you can't go wrong when you pray that. Pray the Lord's Prayer every day with intention. Not like it's just a routine and you're not thinking about the words. With intention. Meaningful in your heart. Pray it every day. And then just talk to the Lord. And make sure in your time with the Lord that you're quiet. Because so many times we do all the talking and then we go on our day. We never give the Lord a chance. He has a lot to say to us. And we don't always give him, how about many times we forget to give him time to speak to us. Because he will, he'll just drop it in your spirit with that still small voice. And you'll just instantly know he's, what he's saying to you. And it's always in line with the word of God. So, you know, how do we gauge if we heard something from the Lord? It's always in alignment with the Word of God and with God's character. So when we read the Old Testament, we learn a lot about what God hates and what He loves. We learn what He, how He punishes when evil and how He, he, re, how he rewards righteousness, obedience to Him, following Him, just saying, you know what, Lord, I'm going to do it your way. Because you know what's best. You have all wisdom. You created all things. Oh, I want to encourage you to read Proverbs 8. My, it's so powerful about God. And the spirit of wisdom, which was with the Lord, he, he, he ordained the spirit of wisdom. And it was with him before he, before he made the world. So awesome. Anyway, I'll do a whole separate thing just on that. Too awesome. There's no way we could do it today. Okay, let's get back to the parable of the ten virgins. At midnight, a cry was heard. And behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. Because, see, they had to, <clears throat> they heard the Lord's coming. They needed to have light in their lamps because they were going out the door to meet him. And it's dark outside. This is the midnight hour. Oh, my Lord just <laughs> showed me something. Here's the thing. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Lord. Here's the thing. They went out the door at the midnight hour and it was pitch black. It was dark outside. Do you know we're living in a day when it's dark outside? Darkness has permeated this earth. And you need to keep oil in your lamps like never before. You need to keep oil in your lamps so that you have light, the light of Christ on fire in you so that you can see clearly. Otherwise, you fall into deception. Otherwise, you make really foolish choices that lead to death or harm. This earth is darkness. But God's light shines brightly within us when we keep that relationship on fire and the oil in our lamp, the Holy, giving, yielding to the Holy Spirit in our lives. So they went out and it was dark. And they needed oil in their lamps so they could see. 
we need oil in our lamp so that we can see the Lord and see what he's telling us clearly to have discernment, wisdom from the Lord. We need to ask the Lord, Father, give us wisdom, give us discernment, fill us with your Holy Spirit overflowing every day in the name of Jesus. Lord, we apply the blood of Jesus over our minds, our bodies, our souls and spirits. Lord, we're covered by the blood of the Lamb. And we're protected and we declare Psalm 121, Psalm 91, Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. And every tongue and I say evil thing that rises against us in judgment. And I say, Lord, you will condemn this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and our righteousness is in him so we say that prayer tell you it's powerful it's powerful and you keep that oil in your lamp every day and you can see clearly and hear from the Lord clearly because darkness cannot overtake you when you have the light of God blazing brightly inside you praise the Lord okay Wow, thank you, Lord. I'm telling you, when you read in the scriptures and you hit a certain thing and the Lord wants to emphasize and, and give deeper revelation about something, he will hit you hard with it. Like instantly you'll have an understanding about a word, a sentence that you just read right over before. Oh, make it a habit. Every day, first things first. You know, the scripture talk about we to give our first fruits to the Lord. Did you know that our time and energy and all that we are, our heart, are our first fruits? <clears throat> so in the morning when you're getting going, before the day hits you like a ton of bricks sometimes, you have that time with the Lord. Some days it might be 15 minutes. But you're going to read scripture, even if you only read a couple scriptures and meditate on them. That is deeper than reading a chapter and you don't even, you didn't get anything out of it. Okay, you don't want to do that. And that refers to the parable of the sower. The very first seed, which represents the word of God that the enemy steals, is that which falls with no understanding. So it's critical that you understand what you're reading. And on the Blue Letter Bible, I give you many tutorials. I will post them. You know what? They're on a different channel. I will post them on this channel so that you will have them because that the tools in that is like having an entire library that Bible scholars were the only ones that had access to or you had to have these huge expensive books. Now it's all at a fingertip on an app that's free with no ads because Chuck Missler and the wonderful people who put that app together did it as end of the Lord. Now if you feel led and you want to donate to them, you, you can and God will bless you for it. But I'm just saying they offer that for free. Praise the Lord because they provide the word of God which everyone should have and they don't market it. And I value that. Okay, so I will upload the Blue Letter Bible app tutorials because I want you to have tools to go deep in the Lord, deep in the Word of God, learn how to look at a cross-reference. So if all we were to do today is read this parable, parable of the ten virgins, which is, you know, we're going to say uh, 13 verses. So that's an example of, honestly, a deep study. And if we go deep on some of these words, I mean, you're going to learn so much. It's going to stick with you. It's going to plant seeds of the Word of God, of truth and discernment and understanding in you, and it's going to produce fruit. So when the seed lands in good soil that the enemy can't steal, with understanding... It will produce fruit. That is what God wants from us. That's the parable of the vineyard. We'll do that a different time. Okay, let's get back to this one. So at the midnight cry, at and at midnight a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out, go out to meet him. 
And though all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. You know, when the Lord comes back for his bride, the scripture says he descends on the clouds. I'll put this in the um, video. It says he descends on the clouds with the trump of God and the voice of the archangel. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And we who remain and are alive will be caught up in the clouds with the air and forever be with the Lord. Now, um, there's a lot to that verse right there. So let's just go over a couple things. I, because I've had people ask me these questions. What does it mean the dead in Christ will rise first? Okay, here's what I want you to understand. The scripture says, when we die and we're born again believers, when we die, to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. So when we die, our spirits immediately go to be with the Lord. Okay? And... Our spirits go to be with the Lord, but our body is made of dust, so it decomposes. Okay? But when the rapture happens, God puts all those particles back together, and their spirit is reunited with their body. However, it's not the old body. We get new bodies that are just like Jesus' resurrected body. What could he do with his resurrected body? After he rose from the dead and he visited his disciples many times, he could walk through walls. He could enjoy a meal with them. He didn't have any of the negative parts to our physical body, but he had the good parts. He could eat. He could visit. But he could also walk right through a wall. He could do things that a spirit does. But he could also enjoy some of the things that a physical body does. And he had a physical body. Remember, he showed Thomas the nails in his hands and feet. And he said, put your, he said, put your hand in my side where I was pierced. But blessed is he who believes and is not seen. Okay? Blessed are we because we believe. And we had not had the opportunity to see those scarred hands and feet and the, where the sword was pierced his side. So, but I will tell you, many people are having visitations from the Lord in these end times. So remember, um, actually I want to encourage you to read Acts chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, because it talks about in the last days, and this is a quote from Joel chapter 2. So we're living in the days that are fulfilling these prophecies of old about the end times. We are living in the end times and there's not much time left. Okay. We're not going to say a date because no man knows the day or the hour, only the Father. But I'm telling you, we can. the Lord says we can see the signs and the seasons. When you see these things, know that it is near, even at the door. Trust me, it's near, even at the door. So, okay, let's go back to um, the parable of the ten virgins, because this is very serious. And then we'll wrap it up, okay? Uh, no, I want to go back to Ephesians, because there's one thing we didn't finish. Okay, parable of the ten virgins. So, okay, then verse 7. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us. But go rather to him who sells and buy for yourselves. Oh my. Here's the thing. In this parable, they're talking about buying oil. But... Um, what is this talking about in spiritual terms for the bride? Here's what it means. I cannot be counted worthy to escape the things to come and have that intimate relationship with the Lord on my parents, on the coattails of my parents' relationship with God. 
I must have my own personal intimate relationship with the Lord. I have to read his word and hear his voice and talk to him and pray. Pray the scriptures. Pray from your heart. Pray when you're in the car. Pray when you're walking. It's important. And then be quiet and listen. Ask the Lord, speak to me, Lord. So when you're born again, the Holy Spirit already lives in you. So really all you're asking is, Lord, give me more. And I would like that prayer language so that I can... Because when we have a prayer language, it's really the Holy Spirit praying the heart of the Father, what the perfect will is, and there we're being invited to participate in that. That's huge. So trust me, there's a very, it's a very powerful way to pray. Pray for whatever. Because sometimes God knows that we need to pray a warfare prayer and we don't even know it. And so if you do that, and it may be a couple words, it may be a sentence, it may be a phrase, it may be diversity of tongues, which is multiple languages. But you can ask the Lord for that. You can ask the Lord for any of the gifts. And, but ask believing in your heart. Okay? And know that the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He won't take you over. Okay, that's what the enemy does. The Holy Spirit participates with you. Okay? So if you pray and say, Lord, I want that to, I want a prayer language. Let's just call it that. Because the Holy Spirit's already living in you when you're born again. The moment you receive Christ, He's living in you. So if you just say, Father, I would like to have a prayer language, a heavenly prayer language that you talk about. Some people refer to it as tongues. Okay? And say, I would like this. And then, you know that God gives perfect gifts to his children. Okay, so you ask for it. Sometimes it comes easier. Other times, maybe you have to just open your mouth and, and make a few sounds like, La, La, Hey, Harandarashi, whatever comes to your, like, just open your mouth and let your voice flow. La, because Holy Spirit works with you. He works with you. He's our comforter. He's our helper. <laughs> He's so awesome. Oh, my goodness. We just can't do this race without him and more of him. So when you're born again, you have him, but we need more. And we want to yield more to him. How do we do that? We pray, Lord, I yield all to you. You're in charge. And I want more of you. Fill me to overflowing. Overflow with your spirit through me. Overflow with your love through me. Overflow with your joy through me. Overflow with your perfect peace that passes all understanding in a chaotic world. Okay, so we've got COVID going on. We've got people freaking out, people fighting politically. But we can have perfect peace. Because we don't, we, we want to be aware of what's happening, but we don't want to focus on that. Our focus needs to be up on the Lord. He is our Father. Jesus is our example. So when he was on this earth, early in the morning, every day he had that time with the Father. Every single day. So we want to have that time with the Lord. It's with the Father. It's with the Son. It's with the Holy Spirit. Because the Lord thy God is one God. He's three in one. He's three persons in one. Okay, so they're always connected. All right. Let's continue on with the parable of the ten virgins. Okay. Um, so remember, the oil we need to get for ourselves is we must each have our own relationship with the Lord. We cannot ride on someone else's coattails or someone else's relationship through association. It just doesn't work that way. God loves you. And he's a consuming fire. And he wants that intimate relationship with you on an individual basis. And he will do the hard part. Trust me. All we have to do is say, yes, Lord. And here's my time. Here's my time. Here's my heart. Here's my mind. Here's my energy. The scripture says and in Deuteronomy, and Jesus quoted this. The Pharisee said, Master, Rabbi which means uh, teacher. What's the most commandment? And they were trying to, they were always trying to trick him up, but since Jesus is the living word, he answered them back with the word and they were always speechless. Okay, because they were religious. They had a religious 
spirit, which is not good. It's evil. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the visible manifestation of the invisible God. Okay? So Jesus is the word, and he spoke the word. So how did Jesus answer them? He quoted from Deuteronomy, but he added a second thing. He said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first great commandment. But the second is like it. You will love your neighbor, which just means people, as yourself. In these lie all the law and the prophets. What did he mean by that? He meant, if you really do those two things, and sometimes people say loving your neighbor as yourself is how would you, how do you want to be treated? That's a good one. But I would take it a step more and say, how would anyone want to be treated? You as well as, because sometimes something that we think, oh, that, but that's no big deal to me if someone does that. But, but that's not really fulfilling that properly. So it's truly, how would Jesus want you to treat others? Think about it that way. How did he treat others? How did he treat others? He loved people. He loved people, but he never compromised the faith. And he never compromised the Word of God, ever. So we follow his example. Please do not put your eyes on people. They will always fall short. And that is where people can go down a wrong path sometimes because they focus too much on a person and they idolize them. Don't do that. Now you're putting an idol. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. People can idolize a person. They can idolize a pastor, a teacher, a leader, a prophet, or somebody who does miracles. Be careful. That is a dangerous path. Those people are servants of the Lord, and they are to be the most servant. And if they put themselves on a pedestal and they're not servants, be careful. Okay? So we keep our eyes on Jesus. He's the one. And... Um, um, we won't go wrong when we do that on his word. Keep our eyes on his word and on the Lord. Okay, so we got that. Now let's go to ten, uh, verse 10. And while they went to buy, okay, so the foolish virgins, didn't they ran out of oil? They didn't even have oil. Remember, they didn't even bring oil with their lamps. They just had a little bit that was in their lamp, but it ran out real quick where the wise had lots extra they kept that daily relationship flowing, overflowing. They kept surrendering their will to the Lord and asking the Lord for more of Him. I want more of you. I want more of you. I want more of you. Okay, that's how you keep your lamps full and overflowing. But the others, you know, okay, so let's give an example. Because people are probably wondering, well, what's an example of, a, of one of the five foolish virgins that didn't have enough oil? How about someone who's been born again, but they're living a double life? Because Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. Now, does that mean you don't make mistakes? No. Because we all make mistakes. You know, we lose our cool, we say the wrong thing, we slip up with something. We, we miss the mark, okay? Because we're human. And we still sin, which is why we want to daily pray the Lord's Prayer and repent. Did you know that in the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, meaning holy is thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, that's the word of God. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so there's none like him. He is the one true God. There are no others. But there's a lot of false doctrine out there. There's a lot of false teachers and there's a lot of false things. So we must cling to the Word of God, 
and seek the Lord in truth and ask Him for discernment. Pray for discernment. Now, I just want to say in the Lord's Prayer, did you notice that the scriptures that it said, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin, which means offend, harm, hurt, do evil against us. You know, because below that prayer, Jesus emphasized, if we don't forgive others who have offended us, abused us, sinned against us, harmed us, cheated us, lied against us, all the sins that can happen. But if we don't forgive them, our Father in Heaven can't forgive us of our wretched sins. It's a requirement. So I want to just um, encourage you right now to make sure you take time in prayer and bring all your hurts before the Lord. Bring all the people before the Lord. And surrender it to the Lord. And there's some hard things that have happened to people. How do you forgive that? I'm going to tell you how you do it. You say, Lord, in obedience to you, I choose to forgive them. And I mean it with all my heart. But Father, I need you to heal those wounds and bring the emotion. Bring the healing to my emotions. So that when that thought of them comes to my mind, I'm not triggered with such anger and bitterness. Because my friends, if you're not careful, that can keep you out of heaven. And I know that's a hard thing to say, but it's the truth. You've got to not let bitterness take hold. Okay? At any point in our lives, we can give it to God. We can give something to the Lord. It may have been with you your whole life. It may have a stronghold. But you can say in the name of Jesus and by the power of your blood, I break this stronghold. I pray, Father, you break this stronghold of unforgiveness, of bitterness, of whatever it is. You name it and you give it to the Lord, believing, claiming by the name of Jesus there's power in his name. And by the blood of Jesus, there's power in the blood. Amen. And I'm telling you, friends, the Lord will do it for you. He will do it for you. It doesn't matter what it is. But you go into your prayer closet and you give it to Him. Surrender. Repentance means you confess your sin. The scripture says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a promise. That is a promise by Almighty God. So you do it. Do your part. Confess and repent means now you turn from that. You're not going to keep living there. Okay, so let's get back to what is it that makes a person who's part of the Bride of Christ one of the foolish virgins. So someone who's living a double life means I'm born again, but I think it's okay to live in sin. So living, it's where you live. It's what you practice. It's not a slip-up, which I'm not encouraging you to slip up, but I'm just saying the Lord doesn't want you to be burdened with guilt. That's from the enemy. He wants to set you free. He forgives it the minute you say, I'm sorry, Lord. And But he wants you to live in victory and not keep going, having to go through that, that torturous routine of I sinned and now I have to repent. Because that's a terrible place to live. You don't want to live there. God can set you free. Jesus came to set the captives free. So, he came to set the captives free. So we surrender to him, we confess to him, and we say, I want to turn from it. But I need your help, Lord, so you fill me with your Holy Spirit. You break every yoke. You pull down every stronghold. And by the power of your name and your blood, in the name of Jesus, I am free in you. And... I'm going to do your will. I surrender my will to you. Your perfect will, thy will be done in my life. You'll be transformed, trust me. It's such a simple prayer, and I'm telling you, God is all over it. So, go for it, okay? Don't delay. Now, and on one more note about who are the five that have that are left behind, that are the foolish virgins, read Revelation 2 and 3. Read Revelation 2 and 3. 
and I will do a teaching on it because those are the seven letters that Jesus himself wrote and he points out the problems. Okay, so there, what are the problems? I'll just tell you in a nutshell. A religious spirit, not true intimacy with the Lord. Sexual sin, you know, on a, on a regular basis. It's a practice and they haven't repented of it. They think it's okay. Um, not putting Jesus first. Did you know that the very first letter in that series of churches, Jesus talks about, you're doing all these things for me, which is awesome, except you left your first love. Like you're not having that intimacy with you. I'm like way over here, but you're doing all this stuff for me. And I'm not okay with that. That's exactly what that letter says. So read those letters and you will know exactly what you don't want to do wrong and what you want to do right. Because Jesus points out this is what you're doing right this is what you need to get straightened out and when you get that straightened out that's what makes you an overcomer and the rapture is for the five virgins who are overcomers who are overcomers not who are backslid who are over and, and living in that state of being messed up but who are overcomers so we all make mistakes, so please don't think it's because you made a mistake. It's not that. But we always want to repent, confess and repent from our mistakes, of our sin. And, and then it's behind us. I want you to leave it behind you. Because Satan will come and he'll try to torment you. And Satan, look at what the loser you were. Um, and you just say, the Lord rebuke you because you're going to be bound in the pit of hell. Because he is. And he, he will flee. Just say, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke The Lord rebuke you, and in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave. And the blood of Jesus comes over, comes over, protects me, and against you, he will flee. Quote the word of God. Quote Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. The enemy will flee before you finish the verse. Okay? How did Jesus fight? How did Jesus fight? So... Let's just recap this. And I'm sorry, but it's so important. When it was time for Jesus to start his ministry, officially, he went to the water to John the Baptist. And he said, I'd like you to water baptize me. Even though he was without sin, he did it as our example. This is why I say, Jesus is our example in every area. So when you read the Gospels, Focus carefully on how did Jesus talk? How did he react to people? Look at his love and compassion. Who did, who's the only type of person in the scriptures that he got angry with? The only type of person he got angry with were the religious leaders who were burdening the people, who were liars and cheaters and who were abusing the authority God gave them that made Jesus angry and those people were in fear of Hades okay so Jesus didn't get mad at the sinners he just called them would you like life come to me and leave that old life behind and I'll give you life eternal I'll give you a life victorious in freedom on this earth because the scripture says he came to set the captives free. I want you to read also Isaiah 53. It's a prophecy about Jesus. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are and were healed. So some of us have some health issues that we still are waiting for our healing. I've had many healings from the Lord, but I'm still waiting for one. But you know what he told me? He told me, and he told me three times as a witness. Keep your eyes on me through the storm, and trust me. So I'm trusting him and I'm not worrying. And you know what? He's brought me so many answers and help 
through natural sources even. So, glory to God. The Lord does things in his own way, and it's not a cookie cutter. It's unique for each person. So I just want to encourage you with that. Now, let's go back to the, the last few verses of the parable of the ten virgins. Verse 10. Whoops. There's that interlinear, which is so awesome. And while they went to buy, okay, so the foolish virgins who were not right with the Lord, they did not have their lamps full of oil. It had gone dry. It had gone dry. And they had been doing their own thing, okay? That's just the bottom line. And in... in against what the Lord requires. Okay, so they were they were dry, they didn't know him, they weren't close to him, and they they were probably committing an offense according to the seven letters. That's why I say read those letters. But anyway, while they left to go get their act together, okay, they went to buy oil, but that's honestly, they went to figure out how to get the relationship right with the Lord. It was too, too little too late. It was too little too late. And the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding. Went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. The door was shut. Okay? And afterwards, the other virgins, those other five that went to try to figure it out, they also came to the spot where the bridegroom was meeting them. So they also came saying, Lord, they're knocking on the door. Lord, Lord, open to us. And they were frantic, let me tell you. But he answered them and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I know you not. I do not know you. In the New King James, the old, the King James says, I know you not. Watch therefore. Okay, so now Jesus is saying, watch therefore. He's speaking to us. Watch therefore. For you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Jesus himself in verse 13 makes crystal clear crystal clear with no doubt that the parable of the ten virgins is a picture of the wedding party of the bride of Christ and only half of those who say I'm called by his name go into the wedding party and the doors are shut so we must make sure and pray according to Luke 21 pray that you're counted worthy to escape the things to come it does not mean you have to be perfect. It means you just need to have your close relationship with the Lord. And you need to be trying. You need to be trying. You can't be like, okay, I was born again at this service over here. And now I can just keep living my life the way I was. That is the problem. Can I just say, so many who say, like if you were to fill out a survey... And they said, Do you, want, you know, what religion are you, this, 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 or this, or nothing? You know, like a huge percentage of the population in the whole world says, well, I'm a Christian. Except, if you were to continue on that survey, survey and ask questions about how you live your life and your relationship with the Lord, you'd have, according to Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins, 50% of the people that checked in the box they're Christians, 50% of them. Do the things the Lord says to do. Bear fruit of the Spirit. Read Galatians 5. Read Galatians 5. It talks about the fruit of the Spirit and the works of the flesh. So it starts off with the works of the flesh are obvious and these, and it gives a long list of things that are sins and you know what it says at the end of that list and please remember Galatians 5 is a letter to the churches it's a letter to the church okay this should frighten people 
And it says, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Will not inherit the kingdom of God. So, your, how you live your life needs to reflect what you say you are. If you say, I'm a believer, I believe in Jesus, I'm a Christian, I'm born again, then your life should be a reflection of that. And it's going to start when you're young, you know, baby steps. But as you mature in the Lord, your fruit's going to increase and increase. You need to have something on your tree, even if it's one little cherry, one little grape, one little nectarine, whatever that little fruit is. But as you mature in the Lord, you need to have a whole tree full of fruit. That's, that's the goal. I mean, you're not going to be left behind if you don't have a whole tree full, full of fruit. But that's the goal, okay? The Lord is faithful to complete the work He started in us, but we have to be willing to participate. We have to be willing to say, yes, Lord, I want to participate. So, you just keep moving along. You keep reading the Word. You keep growing in Him. And as you mature, you're going to have more and more. Okay. Now, um, so Galatians 5. Thank you, Lord. The Lord has to help me stay on track because I do bounce around. So I hope I'm not driving you crazy. <laughs> so bear with me because these are all super powerful scriptures. So Galatians 5 talks about, hey, these are the works of the flesh. You guys can't be living this way. That was in your past. Your new creation's in Christ now. And, brethren, the fruit of the Spirit in your life produce these things. And it gives a list. Peace, love, joy, kindness, goodness. Okay, so read Galatians 5 because it will, it's a really quick Boom! Here's what you don't do. Here's what you do do. Okay? And when you are doing the right things and... So the fruit of the Spirit, we don't have to manufacture that. It comes as a result of us seeking the Lord. It comes as a result of us yielding to the Lord and saying... And reading His Word and saying, Wow, Lord, you said these things? I want to obey you and do that. Please help me. Please help me. Ask Him. Ask the Lord for help in every area. Everything. Your job, your family, your schooling. Most of all, your relationship with Him. And then, if you serve the Lord, absolutely, He needs to be the chief. And you say, Lord, help me in serving you today. Be a light through me today. Let your words flow out of my mouth today. Let your spirit flow through me today. Let your love and joy. Okay? Now, let's go down here. So the, so we just we read the last of the parable of the ten virgins. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Now, let me just clarify something for you, and then we'll uh, go back to Ephesians 1. I'm going to go there now. Um, the seven-year tribulation, the end of the seven-year tribulation, the Lord returns, it says, on a white horse. He has on his thigh King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he conquers the Antichrist, the the, uh, the uh, false prophet and all the evil nations that have come against him to make war with him. He conquers them all by himself. He's more than capable, trust me. He's almighty God. He created the heavens and the earth. Okay? And did you know that we, the bride of Christ who goes up for our wedding, which is a, a week of seven years, did you know we come back with the Lord on white horses? But we don't fight. We're just praising the Lord and cheering Him on. And then, now that, when Jesus returns on the white horse at the very end of the seven-year tribulation, 
that is called the second coming. People frequently mix up the words rapture with second coming. Rapture is only for the bride and it's a catching away, a snatching away, that's what it means in the Greek, just before the, tri the seven year tribulation. And at the end of the seven years, Jesus comes back. That is his second coming to the earth. And you know what he does after he deals with all his enemies? Cast them into hell. He sets up the millennial kingdom. The new Jerusalem comes down, which is described in the scriptures, the exact measurements of it. We dwell in the new Jerusalem with the Lord and his temple. And then those few people who never did take the mark of the beast throughout the tribulation and their lives were, were spared by the Lord, they're the ones who actually populate the millennial kingdom, which is kind of like the Garden of Eden, because the Lord creates a new heaven and a new earth, because it's all destroyed. I mean, when you read Revelation, by the time you get to the sixth seal and the seventh seal, the earth is like a disaster zone. Like, you can't live there. God makes Jesus makes a new heaven and a new earth, and, and it's perfect and beautiful. And that millennial kingdom, it's called millennial because it means 1,000 years. So we, the bride of Christ, rule and reign, this is what the scriptures say, with Christ for 1,000 years. And um, I won't go into what happens after that because uh, we're, I'm already so long on this. But let's just go for one second back to Ephesians 1. And um, I just want to read a couple sentences and then we're going to be done because this got to be a very multi-faceted <laughs> study. Okay, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, I'm reading in verse 3, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Praise the Lord. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Notice there verse 4. That we should be holy and without blame. That means we're not living in sin. In a state of sin. In him in love. Oh, how he loves you. His love for you is so intense. He burns with fire his love and he wants us to recognize that love receive it and love him back because he's paid the ultimate price to to purchase us from the enemy see the enemy owned us what jesus did on the cross he bought us back with his own blood he said i'm going to die a torturous death be beaten nearly to death humiliated tortured in a million ways and on that cross and shed his blood because I love you so much for you because I want you in my family I love you you're my child now anyone who's a parent I mean like what Jesus went through I don't know if anybody could, nobody really could do that and even if you were willing to lay your life down for someone because some people can do that Jesus said there's no greater love than someone leaves his life down for his friends so people have died for others but no one could live a perfect life that was sinless to qualify as the Lamb of God who's pure in order to to have all the sin of the world on you and take our punishment that's what Jesus did no one no one has done that no one can do that every one of us. The scripture says all have sinned. All means all. From the beginning of mankind, starting with Adam and Eve, all the way until, until, until the end of redemption. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we all need a Redeemer, a Savior, someone who took that punishment for us, who was perfect and qualified to take it. And only Jesus, God's only Son, who is called the Word in heaven with God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. 
All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. So, Jesus always existed with the Father, and so did the Holy Spirit. And he willingly went, Yes, Father, I will go be the kinsman redeemer. It's from the book of Ruth, with a foreshadowing. Be the kinsman redeemer. I will qualify and be the sacrificed lamb of God. So, so I want to explain that in the Old Testament, the sacrifice that they had to do, to, blood was always required to cover sin. God makes the rules, we don't. And he said, blood, the life is in the blood, and blood is what's required to cover sin. And we're talking an animal had to be killed, and its blood had to cover. It was just to foresh It wasn't because there was something special about animal blood. It was because it was a foreshadowing of the literal fulfillment of Jesus Christ. See how the Old Testament points to Christ? And at the appointed time, Jesus fulfilled that in the scriptures. And he was the sacrificed lamb who takes away the sins of the world. And did you know that the very hour that Jesus took his last breath and said, It is finished, was the same time the priests in the temple were sacrificing the, the lamb um, on the altar, exact parallel, and that was on Passover. Jesus fulfilled all the spring feasts on that day, and he's going to fulfill all the fall feasts on those days. So that'll be a whole separate thing. Okay, I, all I want us to do is get through one paragraph of Ephesians once. We're going to go back and finish. Okay, having predestined us to adoption as sons, by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Now, here's what I love about the New King James. It capitalizes the words that scholars believe is referring to Jesus Christ. Um, because... All the translations capitalize when it's referring to God the Father for the most part. But <clears throat> the New King James is one of the few that capitalizes. So this is capitalized in the Beloved. That is referring to by which he the Father made us accepted in the Beloved, which is Jesus. Made us accepted in Jesus. We are seen as pure, white, accepted holy through the blood of Christ when we're born again. If you haven't been born again, today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. Do not wait another day because you don't know if you'll get in a car accident. You don't know if you'll get an illness and die or something will happen where you won't have that opportunity. Do not delay. Today is the day of salvation. And I'm going to read a couple more verses and then just share a super short prayer and if you want to say it you're going to be born again and your name's going to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life today. Verse 7, in him we have redemption, so to be redeemed means you are bought with a price through his blood. So the price was the blood of Christ. We were bought with the blood shed of Christ when he died on the cross. In him we have the redemption we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins. According to the riches of his grace, by which he made us, or which he made us, he made to abound toward us. In all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of time so basically there's all these periods in history periods of times are called dispensations so basically at the appointed time in the exact dispensation season of time in history he might gather together 
in one all things in Christ, both that which are in heaven and that which are in earth, in him. Okay, so that means those who have already died in the Lord and they've gone to heaven, and those of us who are alive are going to be regathered with him, he's going to bring us all together in Christ. In him, in Christ, also we have obtained an inheritance because we've been made children of God, so we have an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. So we're going to stop there. But the point is, is that when you receive Christ as your Savior and you say, Lord, I receive you as my Savior. I recognize you're the Son of God and you are the only way to the Father and to eternal life. You're the only one who qualified to shed your blood, to take the punishment for the world, including my sin, and to provide eternal life. So even if I die in this physical body, I will be with you in eternity. And let me tell you, friends, the spirit life is more real than this. This is like a gray fog compared to how real eternity is. Whether that eternity is with the Lord in heaven and then in the, in the millennial reign and for eternity, or whether that eternal destiny is in hell, that too is very real. And we don't want to go to that. Jesus himself spoke of hell and mentioned it so many times. It's real. Don't believe anyone who says it's not. It's real. And everyone who's in hell believes it. Trust me. But once you take your last breath on earth, it's too late. You cannot make that decision because once you, once you enter into the spirit realm for eternity, oh, you know it's real. And there's no option then because we are saved by the grace of God through faith, believing in Jesus Christ and receiving what he did for us. So let's say that prayer right now you want to pray this with me, say this prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for what you've done and for sending your son Jesus, who is the pure Lamb of God, who took our punishment and shed his blood for the redeeming, for buying us back, for taking our punishment and paying the price that was due. Lord, I receive his sacrifice and I receive him right now as my Lord, the Lord of my life and as my Savior. Lord, I thank you that you brought me into the family of God. And Lord, I believe and I receive the Holy Spirit that you seal me with for the day of redemption when I go home to be with you. And I thank you, Lord, for salvation. And I give you praise and glory. And I ask you to direct my steps. And I surrender my will to you. Transform me to be just like you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, friend, praise the Lord. If you said that prayer, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I want to tell you something. On Judgment Day, which happens way at the end, even after the thousand-year reign, that's when we have the great white throne judgment, the books are opened, and the Lamb's Book of Life is opened, and everyone whose name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life is not subject to that judgment. We're not. Because the Lord says, Oh, you belong, you're in my family, and you're covered by the blood of Jesus. You are on this side with me in my family. But friends, those whose names are not written in there, or whose names have been blotted out, and I only say that because in Revelation there's one letter to one church where they were in great sin and they did not repent, and Jesus said, if you don't repent, I'm going to blot your name out. So we're going to talk about the letters another time because that's not necessary. All we have to do is repent confess our sin to him he instantly forgives and cleanses us and we say I'm following you I'm doing it your way the right way the way that leads to life not death the way that's in truth not deception so there's no need for anyone's name to not be in the book of life it's all by each person's choice and so if you said that prayer today your name's in the Lamb's book of life And no one can pluck you out of the Father's hand. And 
You are not, you do not lose your salvation if you make a simple mistake and repent of it. But the purpose is to, we're called, just as we read in these scriptures today, to be holy, to walk with the Lord and to grow in Him. Okay, it's a process. I do not want you to worry about starting that process and stumbling a little other than pray to the Lord and ask for His help. And ask him to show you what he wants you to get out of your life that's not of the Lord. Meaning like a sinful thing. You don't throw your spouse out, okay? You pray for their salvation. There might be things you're participating in that he wants to set you free from. So that's the kind of thing you would pray and ask for his help. And we talked about that earlier, so I won't go into that. Okay, I want to leave you with a blessing prayer. And it's called the Aaronic Blessing, and it's found in Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through, I believe, 26. But I'll put it on the screen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom. God bless you. I hope you were blessed by the, all these scriptures, and we will continue in Ephesians and also in the end time scriptures. God bless you. Bye-bye.